so urologists aren't scary people. Men are, men are difficult patients. If it were up to us to procreate, there'd be like 12 people left. You know, the game is on, or there are a lot of other things that come up. They're important. But women really drive fertility. And what I want to talk about today is male infertility and erectile dysfunction and prostate disease. So don't be afraid of your doctor. Men really need to do their part because half of infertility in couples is related to the male. We need to step up and represent. Go to your doctor, get examined, have a semen analysis, get your blood drawn. Let's figure out that we're responsible for half of the issues. Let's fix it and move forward. So, a patient comes to my office He's 45 years old, he's interested in fertility, and he went to his internist about his libido and his erection in June of 2011. He was given testosterone injections. December 2011 comes around, his new sperm count is 5 million, but normal is 20 million. April 2012 comes around, and now he has 600,000 sperm. He was happy because his libido was better and his erection was better and his wife was happier until she saw his sperm count. So this is a schema of the hypothalamic pituitary axis that I show to the medical students every year at UCLA, but it's a little complicated, so I'm going to make it really simple. Right here is testosterone, and basically what you do when you give exogenous testosterone, you block the rest of the function of the testicle. So it functions like a male birth control. The testosterone is helpful for libido, cognition, well-being, bone density, but not fertility. Not only that, but there are a lot of physicians as well as patients who believe that by taking testosterone, their sperm count's gonna go up. That just is not the case, so you need to be aware. So take home messages on the fertility side Stop smoking cigarettes and marijuana. Limit yourself to a coffee a day, one alcoholic beverage a few times a week. Reduce your stress levels. Eat a balanced diet. Exercise, but don't overdo it. Avoid excessive heat and take a multivitamin. So what happens when you get an erection? What happens is the smooth muscle of the penis relaxes. That's what happens. Blood enters the penis, it's trapped there, it gives you rigidity. Now, what people think intuitively is that contraction of a muscle is what makes it work. That's what's doing it. But really, with the penis, what happens, it relaxes. That's what gives the erection. Now, contraction of the muscle that can come from stress, the release of catecholamines and things like that, can inhibit the erection. So ladies, if your man is having trouble getting an erection, don't stress him out. It's just going to make it worse. <laughs> now, testosterone is only mildly related to, to erection, meaning that you need a certain level of testosterone in your blood to achieve an erection, but that level isn't even within the normal limit of the testosterone. So this is a schema of the penis, cut and cross-section. If you look here, this is the erectile body. This is the other erectile body. And on the bottom is the urethra. So these are the paired erectile bodies. Now, if you look at this outer covering here, it's called the tunica, and it's very strong. But it doesn't, it's not infinitely strong. So when the patient gets an erection, what happens is the tunica thins, the penis lengthens, and these veins here are cut off so that the blood doesn't leave the penis, but you get rigidity from the inflow of the blood. So you can break that. You can fracture a penis. That is something a lot of people don't want to hear. It's something I don't want to say, but it's true. So what happens? Typically, the man is, is lying down, the woman's on top, and she comes down at a bad angle, and there's, there's a bend, and if it's bad, there's a break. 
That's what a penile fracture is. <laughs> I'm sorry. The fracture is associated with pain, obviously, and needs to be surgically repaired. And if it's not, then the function may be affected and often is in the future. Now, you don't have to break it to damage it. So if there's trauma, the way I described, but it doesn't end up in a fracture, you can end up with a scar. And wherever the scar tissue is, that's the direction the erection bends in. So if you look here on the top at the fibrous plaque, what happens is the top of the penis there is unable to lengthen like the bottom. So it curves upward. That's Peroni's disease. Now, another favorite topic of guys, ejaculation. It's not the same as orgasm. Interestingly enough, and a lot of people don't know this, you don't need an erection to ejaculate. And the biggest problem I see with regard to ejaculation in my practice is rapid or what's known as premature ejaculation. And people say, oh, that's a man's problem. Well, the last time we checked, it's the man that has the orgasm. So for him, it's not, well, it's a couple's issue. <laughs> and it relates to control. So what do we do? We help the men regain their control with things like promescent, which is a desensitizing spray that helps take down the sensitivity a little. We use medications like antidepressants that will delay the orgasm. And there are certain behavioral programs that we use to help modify behaviors and delay the time to ejaculation. So this is the other big myth I wanted to talk about. Everybody thinks, oh, my prostate is big, that's why I have a problem. Bigger prostates aren't necessarily any more symptomatic than prostates that are smaller. Small prostates can have as much or more problems as large prostates. The best medicines that we use are medicines that relax the muscle to allow the patient to void more easily and to empty their bladders. They don't shrink the prostate. There are some medications that only work on larger prostates. And you may have heard of some of them. One is called finasteride, and the other is called dutasteride. The trade names are Proscar and Avidart. And what recently happened is that the FDA came and put another warning associated with finasteride, saying that some of the men that had a decrease in their libidos with the medication had a decrease in their libidos after they stopped taking the medication. So those aren't necessarily the best medicines for the prostate. So from a urology perspective, what kind of take home messages do I want to deliver to this audience? Number one, men take charge of your health and your health care. Women, be supportive of the weaker sex. Three, don't be afraid of your doctor. Uh, do, do I seem intimidating to you? Good. Get your questions answered, dispel the myths, be healthier, and have a better sex life and a better fertility. Thank you.